We will hear next from Corey Keller, who is a pediatric genetic counselor at Oregon State Health and Science University and Shriners Hospital in Portland. She enjoys working with families who have neuromuscular conditions to help them better understand the genetic basis of their condition, testing options and results, and as well as the potential impacts for other family members. So, Corey, I will let you share your screen and turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much for all your help, too, for the previous session. Great. Looking forward to it. I think I'm still waiting for some permission to share my slides, and I'm guessing that's coming rapidly. There is a, a lag. There we go. There. Looking there. good. Yes. So I'm looking forward to focusing my talk on genetic testing mostly for the muscular dystrophies. And I work at OHSU, which is a fascinating place where there's two parts of campus, one at the bottom of the hill and one at the top. And if you're not into traditional transportation, like cars and buses, you can take a tram up the mountain. Well, I'm guessing that all of you are quite experienced with what physicians do and what nurses and the physical therapists and occupational therapists on the team. Some people are less familiar with genetic counselors. So what I do as part of the neuromuscular team is really gather information from families about their families and really think about which people would be best to test, talk about some of the testing options, help families navigate that process, and then really help them understand the results, what they mean for themselves, what they mean for other family members, and plot a path forward to move on with their lives from that diagnosis. I hope to start by convincing you that genetic testing is vital for almost every person with a muscular dystrophy today, run through some basic information about genetics, and then finish with how you actually go about getting genetic testing and understanding what those results show. So I feel that genetic testing is really vital to understand exactly what's going on. With some genetic conditions, this is very straightforward. Everybody with Duchenne or Bacular muscular dystrophy has a change in one particular gene, the dystrophin gene. There are some patients who we can't find what that specific change is yet. Everybody with spinal muscular atrophy has that same chunk missing out of the survival motor neuron gene. Though, like Dr. Regal said, some of them have extra copies of another very closely related gene. But with some conditions like limb girdle muscular dystrophy, which has come up several times, it gets very confusing and complicated. Genetic can, testing can change how we treat a patient, what complications we're looking for, what clinical trials are available, and it can have big impacts on knowing which other family members are at risk. So I already talked about clarifying exactly what's going on with somebody. And I think it's also really important to know what medical problems go along with this. Is this a condition that has heart disease risk? Is there any hearing loss that we should be screening for? Those types of problems. As well as to generally understand the prognosis. We never can predict for any one person or one family their specific prognosis, but we can know in general this is very slowly progressive and it's unusual to need a wheelchair during your life, or this condition tends to protect progress more quickly and oftentimes children need some need wheelchair support earlier on in the course. And another thing that I think is really important about having a diagnosis is being able to meet with others virtually, by phone, by email, and talk. This is what I'm experiencing. What have you tried? What has been helpful for you? And have a group that really understands where you're, what you're going through right now.
And I know that Dr. Regal kind of started the talk about limb girdle muscular dystrophy, but this is one of the most challenging classes because there's so many different genetic causes that can run in different patterns in families. So I'm going to use this model to kind of talk about some of those things. Reaching a diagnosis. So let's picture two individuals with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. They were diagnosed by a physician a long time ago with limb girdle, but really never knew what type they had. So one individual is tested and is found to have a change in, I'm sorry about all this movement, in calpaneopathy. So this typically presents with people walking on their toes, difficulty running, and that slowly progressive muscle weakness that is really common for all of the muscular dystrophies. It's good when we learn this because we know that there's really not much risk of heart disease. This is typically an issue with the other muscles. The family can then join the Facebook group if they're interested in that. And I think that we're always cautious with going online with oftentimes these are run by other people with the disorder and it can be super helpful to learn from them. But it's always important to both validate any information you learn, talk with your team, and to also realize that sometimes families that seek support and share their stories may tend to be a little more significantly affected than the average family. Another individual is diagnosed with one of the causes of Emery-Dreyfus syndrome, and there's a couple genetic causes, but this individual happens to have a genetic change in that lamin A gene, L-M-N-A. And this is a little different because it often has joint contractures, so joints that don't stretch out all the way, as well as that progressive muscle weakness. One thing that's pretty different is that they have a pretty significant risk of heart problems, both problems with the way the heart muscle works, like cardiomyopathy, as well as the way the electrical current runs in the heart. So problems with cardiac conduction as well. And there's a number of Emory Dreyfus Facebook groups that can be helpful. When you start looking at treatment, there's standard treatment for all of the neuromuscular conditions, but oftentimes this is really supportive treatment. And what we're looking for are those home runs that Dr. Regal was talking about. So directed, targeted therapies for your condition and maybe even for the specific genetic change you have. And he already also mentioned some of the resources that I use when I'm looking to see what's available. So for these two conditions, for people with changes in the calpain gene, the supportive therapies are always there, like the physical therapy, stretching, supporting lung function, and similarly with Emory Dreyfus, as well as making sure that the heart is very closely looked at. But looking ahead to the future and those home runs, there is a organization, C3, the Coalition to Cure Calpain 3, that is devoted to raising money and funding clinical trials. And in a, an exciting development, they have C trial for Calpain. And we all know that mouses are not mice, are not humans, but it can help us tell, is this likely to be helpful? And also, are there any major safety concerns that we need to think about before we even try this in humans? We're not as far along for the much rarer cause of Emory Dreyfus muscular dystrophy without LAM and A. When I looked, there are no actively recruit recruiting clinical trials but we know that lamin A causes a lot of problems, including people who have heart problems only without any of the muscle problems. And for them, there are a bunch of different drug trials to support the heart. And it could be that one of those medications also helps with some of the other muscle problems that can go along with Emory Dreyfus. Family is something that myself as a genetic counselor thinks about a lot because while we have the person with the condition in front of us, I'm always thinking, are there any other people in the family who may have the same diagnosis and just not know about it yet, who really could benefit from some treatment? Are there other people who might carry the condition who are thinking about having kids who may want to learn about carrier testing? 
And also, once you do genetic testing and find the specific cause in the individual with a condition, then that allows us for simple and pretty cheap testing for other people, because you don't have to look at all the genes involved. You just zero in on where the change is in that one person and say, yes, this individual we're testing has the same change, or no, they don't. It also allows for fancy technology like going through in vitro fertilization and testing the clumps of cells before they're implanted into a mom to see if that clump of cells has that same genetic change. And it allows for testing during pregnancy. So with these conditions are actually inherited in different ways. Like Dr. Regal said, the limb girdle muscular dystrophies currently with the two are inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern. And that's when both mom and dad have one working gene and one not working gene. And by chance, the child happens to inherit a not working gene from mom and a not working gene from dad. So in that situation, the parents are usually healthy carriers. And like Dr. Regal said, each other sibling has a one in four chance of having the same condition. But as the person with the calpanopathy grows up, they would only have a child with the same condition if they meet someone else who carries a change in that same gene. And that's pretty unlikely. So carrier testing can be really helpful because if the partner doesn't carry it, then you really don't have to worry about it. The situation's pretty different with this dominant form of Emery Dreyfus due to the lamin A. Other forms of Emery Dreyfus are inherited in different ways, but I'm just gonna focus on this one today. So with autosomal dominant conditions, if you have one gene change, that dominates the other gene and you've got the condition. So with this form of Emery Dreyfus, it's usually brand new in a child. When you check mom and you check dad, they don't have it. It's really hard to copy 20,000 genetic directions to make your egg and make your sperm and new changes happen all the time. So this is often new in a child. And when it's new, it's not something that's likely to happen again in that, that couple's other kids. However, sometimes it's inherited from a mom or a dad with the same condition. So this is something if we find a lamin A change that causes Emery Dreyfus in somebody, we often offer testing to mom and dad to figure out could they be mildly affected and just not know about it yet. If a mom or dad has the genetic change, and if that person with Emory Dreyfus is thinking about having kids, they have a one in two or 50% chance with each pregnancy of passing it on to their kids. And I'm going to switch gears a little bit now that hopefully I've convinced you how important it is to know what the genetic change is and talk about some basics of genetics. And as I was preparing this talk, my husband said, so you're going to try to teach all of genetics in two slides. And I said, I'm working with a very smart group of people. I'm sure that we can do that. So we have a bunch of cells that build our body from our brain cells to our skin cells to our muscle cells and in the middle of almost every one of those cells is the nucleus and that is where all of our genetic most of our genetic information is and it's packaged up you can see it coiled really tightly in these packages called chromosomes and chromosome conditions cause a bunch of different genetic disorders. So if you have a whole extra chromosome 21, then you have Down syndrome. And some of our people that we follow at our neuromuscular clinic were actually picked up as having genetic disorders on chromosome studies. So they were found to have a duplication tech that causes Charcomery tooth type 1A or because they had developmental delays, they had a chromosome test that showed they had a deletion of dystrophin and have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But that's not the most common thing we're looking for. If you follow the slide and kind of uncoil all that tightly, tightly wrapped DNA, you see we've got our individual base pairs of our genetic code. So when we think about the spelling of our genes, our genes are transcribed to make proteins that actually work in our body. 
So we think about things that work in our body, like the dystrophin that helps anchor the muscle cells all together and hold everything together. And the part that I think is most important here is that that code is read in chunks of three. Each group of three, I think about this kind of like Legos, that AUG might say to put a red Lego in, the next AUC might code for a blue Lego, and then you get the entire genetic code of that protein until it says stop, you're done. But you can imagine that there's lots of things that can go a little bit differently here. And all of our genetic codes are a little bit different. Most of those differences are perfectly normal variation, but sometimes there's a pathogenic change that causes a disease. So this obviously is not the actual genetic code, but if you think about a sentence that's made up of groups of three, like cat ate the rat, Sometimes you can have a single letter that's changed. Like let's say that R in rat is changed to a B in bat. Cat ate the bat. Well, you still get the basic idea. The cat ate something. And you might be a little more worried about rabies if he ate the bat. But the, the general idea is there. And depending on where exactly this is, that rat section may be an incredibly important part of the protein and this could still be a bad genetic change but oftentimes these changes are a little bit milder because you can still get the general idea of what's going on you can also have nonsense changes and that's where instead of that stop sign we talked about coming at the very end after everything was done and ready that stop sign comes right in the middle of the gene and these are usually recognized by the body as not being complete proteins and the body degrades it. So that tends to be more severe. And also when you have genetic changes that aren't in groups of three, like if you just take out that E in eight, everything is kind of nonsense and eventually you get to a stop sign as well. Similarly with deletions and duplications, if you take out something in groups of three, that may not be as severe. Whereas if you add or subtract something in a different arrangement, like only in a group of two, then that can cause significant changes as well. So now that we've talked a little bit about the variants, let's dive into genetic testing. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the types of genetic tests, how you can go about getting it if you're interested, how much it costs, and kind of what those results might mean. So I think about this as starting with single gene testing. So if you're dealing with a condition like spinal muscular atrophy or Duchenne muscular dystrophy or Becker muscular dystrophy that are usually caused by just one gene, then this testing tends to be cheaper and easier. In addition for just looking at the sequence or the spelling of that gene, the tests today also usually look for extra and missing chunks. If you're dealing with another condition, like Charcot-Marie Tooth, where you've kind of ruled out the nice, simple, easy to find, most common CMT type 1A, that duplication I talked about earlier, there's a lot of different genetic causes of CMT. And similarly for limb girdle muscular dystrophy, lots of genetic causes. So today we often offer a genetic sequencing panel where the lab is looking simultaneously at many different genetic directions that are related to that disorder and looking for deletions and duplications as well. For some people, including some of our people with limb girdle muscular dystrophy where we haven't found the cause, we've gone on to exome sequencing. And this is trying to look at the spelling of all of the proteins, how those genetic directions are spelled. This testing gets much more expensive and is also pretty complicated to interpret because like I talked about, every one of us have some spelling differences and the lab really has to sort out what are those spelling differences are part of our normal variation and which part might cause disease. And I'm going to leave the next part aside because it's not really ready for prime time today. 
So if you're interested in genetic testing, I would just start by talking with a healthcare provider. This could be your neuromuscular doctor, this could be another physician, it could be a genetic counselor, or others on the team. And in this era of COVID and the pandemic, usually this can be done by a video visit. So you can be safely at home throughout this entire process. We can help you find an appropriate lab, help you figure out how much it costs and get a sample sent. Like I said before, the costs vary pretty dramatically depending on what kind of test you're doing. If you know what changes in your family, the test tends to be pretty easy and much less expensive. Whereas if you need to do that whole exome sequencing and you're looking through all of the genes and maybe comparing it to what your mother and what your father have in their genes, it gets more expensive. This testing is co typically covered by medical insurance. And in the state of Oregon, we've had very good luck with coverage through the Oregon Medicaid system. However, pre-authorization might be required. It depends on your insurance and you may have a copay as well. One thing that has been happening in the last couple of years is that there's some sponsored testing available that you do not have to pay for. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And if for some reason your insurance won't pay for it or you don't have medical insurance, some labs now offer discounted testing for families who can pay up front or families with financial need. So right now, a number of industry sponsors help pay for testing at commercial labs. So this testing is free to the individual being tested. And in exchange, the companies who are often developing, as Dr. Regal said, fairly expensive therapies, but very important therapies, get data about how many people have, for instance, which type of limb girdle, muscular dystrophy, and things like that. This can be a little bit challenging to navigate for some individuals who aren't used to ordering genetic testing. And so you can always talk with your neuromuscular care team or genetic counselor about this. I looked in terms of yesterday what was available, and like I said, this changes. Currently, there is testing for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, both for people who might have the condition as well as healthy carriers testing for spinal muscular atrophy as well as carriers, some testing for people who have muscular dystrophy and we don't know yet what the type is. So large panels looking at a bunch of different genes that can cause muscular dystrophy, as well as more specific testing for amyloidosis, the form that runs in families, as well as periodic paralysis. The sample collection for the past few months, we've been doing most of our testing completely at home. So we can often talk to people by using the video chat, and then we can simply send a kit out and they either can spit in a tube or do a swab of their cheek. There are a few labs and a few tests that require blood draws, but that's a little less frequent today. And obviously, if there's a pregnant woman being tested, she would need a procedure, like Dr. Regal said, to get a sample to do that testing. There's a couple things to think about, and as a genetic counselor, I spend a lot of time thinking about ethical issues, and one is testing children. Everybody agrees that if we think a child might have a neuromuscular condition, we should test them because that's going to change their medical management. We can take care of them better. This is a little different if you're testing to see if a child is a carrier. And it's a lot different if there's an adult onset condition, like the rare causes of ALS that run in families. We don't recommend testing kids for that kind of condition. We would prefer kids to wait and make a decision for themselves as they grow up. We know from a number of genetic diseases that it's not uncommon for adults to decide they don't want that information, that they feel like it would change their lives. And we really want kids to have that option to know and decide for themselves later on. So if they're not gonna change anything, then I would recommend thinking about waiting until they can understand the result. We don't want kids who find out that they're a healthy carrier to think that they're ill.
We don't want kids who find out they're a carrier to think that they can't have kids or it limits their career options. We really want them to have good information and have power over their own genetic information. Finally, one thing to think about is if you're considering genetic testing for something that might happen in the future, is to realize that there is a Genetic Insurance Non-Discrimination Act that prohibits today your particular insurance company from raising your rates or dropping you if you find out you are likely to develop a genetic condition. But there's a few insurances that aren't specifically protected that you might want to think about. In terms of genetic testing results, we always hope for something straightforward. Yes, you have it, or no, you don't. But there's kind of a lot of shades of gray. When you find a change that's labeled as pathogenic, that means that this is the cause of the neuromuscular condition. Similarly, likely pathogenic means the lab feels there's over a 90% chance this explains what's going on. And we usually treat likely pathogenic changes the same as pathogenic in terms of offering therapies and things like that. The negative results means that we can't find anything. It doesn't mean you don't have a muscular dystrophy. It may simply be that our genetic tests can't find it today. As Dr. Regal said, this is pretty common with the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. My least favorite result of all times, as those of you who I've talked with in our neuromuscular clinic know, is variance of uncertain significance. And that simply means that you have one of those changes that the lab doesn't yet know. Is this part of normal variation or does it cause disease? And so here's an example of that. You can have a spelling error in a single change. And the way you read this is that at the 854th part of the gene, where most of us have a C, this individual has a T. So that building block that I was talking about, which is usually an ALA alanine, in this person is a VAL valine. And then the lab tells us a little bit about it. It tells us it's heterozygous. So they only found one genetic change, not two. And it says that, well, these, these two building blocks, the haline and the valine, eh, they're pretty similar to each other. So maybe this isn't such a bad change. But we haven't seen this in the large population databases of people without any known issues. So it's certainly not very common. And we haven't seen it before in people with neuromuscular conditions due to this gene. And then they usually use a bunch of computer programs to say, well, what do you think? Does this computer program think this is a bad change that causes disease or not? And the computer programs all said, oh, this probably isn't such a bad change. And then often the labs will talk about testing families. So in this case, if a child has an early onset muscular dystrophy, and you test mom, and she has the exact same change as a child without any muscle problems, we're going to say that, oh, this is more likely to be one of those normal changes. But if the change is brand new in the child, not in mom, not in dad, then we might say, boy, this really could be an explanation. And our hope is that as more people get genetic testing, we can clarify these changes a little bit better. So with that, I'm going to leave you with a couple resources if you need to locate a genetic counselor. And there's really some nice genetic information at the genetics home reference. So I am happy to take any questions. Just type them into the Q&A tab. But I appreciate your attention. And it was fun to get a chance to speak with all of you this morning. Thank you very much, Corey. Uh, we did get one question. Uh, this person is saying that they had a variant test result. It was about 10 years ago. Would you recommend that they get retested? That's a good question. If you already know the variant, then often you can just call the care team who will get in touch with the lab, and they can often just over the phone or on their databases do a search and say, have they seen this change again? Have they interpreted it differently? What do the databases say now? So you often don't need additional testing. 
So have th I know things have progressed quite a bit in the future. So if someone did get a test that was then turned, that was returned negative, however, they're still having symptoms and it's been years, you would suggest getting retested? I think, I think uh, maybe not getting retested with the same test, but looking at what tests are available today. Okay. Even five, 10 years ago, we weren't doing that big genetic testing, whole exome sequencing, trying to look at everything. Mm -hmm. And we're doing that fairly commonly today. And the Charcot-Marie tooth panels and limb girdle panels used to just include a couple genes because we didn't know very much. Mm -hmm. And now they include over 100 genes. And so we're certainly, it's been pretty explosive in terms of what's available with genetic testing. Okay. Um, one other question. What is the difference, if any, between saliva and blood tests? Are they the same? Is one better than the other? Well, with saliva, you often don't get quite as much DNA. But the first thing that the lab does when they get a saliva sample or a blood sample is go through quantity con quality control to make sure there's enough DNA and it's high enough quality. So occasionally we get a call, we didn't get enough DNA, and we simply send in another sample. So if they get good enough quality DNA, the results tend to be exactly the same, and they both are equally valid. That's a really good question. Okay. And this, the last question I'm seeing, are there any financial, um, assi is there any financial assistance that um, can be applied towards genetic testing if the insurance doesn't cover it? Yeah, I talked about some of the labs that offer financial help, and I would strongly recommend looking into some of those sponsored testing programs. Okay. We've been able to test, I would say, at least 10 people who previously we couldn't get testing because their insurance company wouldn't cover it. And now that there's sponsored testing, large panels available, we've been able to get testing for no charge. And so I think that that's particularly valuable right now. Okay. And I see the other question on there that the doctor was testing a, a child four years ago and didn't get any answers. And I would definitely talk with your genetics team, with your neuromuscular team mm -hmm. about what's available today and could we get answers today? Because even in five years, our testing options have grown considerably as well as understanding those results and what they might mean. Sure. All right. Well, I think I don't see anything else popping into our chat or Q&A. So I appreciate all your time. Yes. For, thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed presenting this morning. All right. Thank you.